Hi, everybody. I'm Angela Hart, and welcome to the Heart of New York show. We have been airing a series of shows that deal with senior care and senior topics, and I am privileged and honored to have a group with me today from Centers Healthcare. Centers Healthcare is responsible for the health and well being of over 15,000 people in the United States. They have a lot to tell us, and people who are watching this will learn a lot about what to do to take care of the seniors whom they love. And so I'm going to ask my guests to introduce themselves to you, beginning on my right. Good afternoon. I'm Gabriela Maciel. I represent Bushwick Center Adult Daycare. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Hello. My name is Richard Osoria, and I represent Bushwick Center Adult Daycare. Thank you for being with us, Richard. Thank you. Hi, Angela. I'm Lynn Cortella, and I'm a registered nurse working for Centers Healthcare. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Michael Hach. I'm the administrator at Martin Center, part of the Centers Healthcare organization. And so we're dealing today with assisted living and adult daycare. There is some misunderstanding regarding adult daycare. So many of us have our seniors whom we love going to social daycare and going to senior centers. So I would like the guests to please tell us what is the difference between adult daycare, senior care, and some of these other facilities. Great. I'm happy you asked, Angela, it's because a lot of folks think that um, the only recourse they have is to go to a senior center. But in actuality, a senior center sometimes requires a certain age group to go only, and they are able to come and go, whereas there's more structure in an adult daycare. And there's two types. There's a social model and there's a medical model. Um, the social model will require a home attendant, and whereas the medical model has, it's basically a one-stop shopping. You have the nurse on site, you have therapies on site, and of course, some fun too. <laughs> Why is it necessary for a home health aide to be with someone at, that they bring there? Um, it's not so much that, that they're with them at the center. What it is is uh, they need to bill through the home care agency and that's why they have a home attendant. Very For billing purposes more than anything. Very interesting. And so that takes us to the discussion about insurance and who pays for these right. costs. Rich, would you like to discuss some of those topics? I would actually like to throw that off to Michael. <laughs> Okay, Michael? I believe that what Gabby is referring to in terms of the two types of models when it comes to daycare programs. There's the medical model, adult day health care program, and the social model, social day program. The home health aid that's required is only required for those attending the social day program. And that's a prerequisite in order for someone to qualify to go to a social day program. The medical model does not require a home health aid or any right. home health services to attend. So how would the viewers know which is right for their loved one? I think when you look at a medical model, it provides everything that you need. You have the nurse on site, you have uh, physical therapy, you have occupational therapy, you have uh, CNAs, which are basically uh, nursing assistants, and you have a recreational therapist that provides activities throughout the day. Everything's basically there. If you go to a social model, it's basically having fun the whole time. And and thank you. And so uh, let's say uh, my mom is living at home, and so one of those types of places would be best, obviously. How do I know which one and how do I apply to get there? I mean, how does one, you don't can't just show up with your mom one day or your dad. So what are the steps that one would go through? And, and decide which is best. Right. We actually, there are places that you can walk in and uh, ask for an appointment to come for a tour, or sometimes uh, different centers offer you a day pass. And with the day pass, it's a good idea to always bring a family member or a decision maker because you would want to know where your loved one is spending most of their time. Right? And you get to see firsthand whether it's something that you're going to like to be at hopefully on a daily basis. Um, so during the day pass, you get to experience everything without the obligation of having to join. If you do decide that this is something that's right for you and you qualify for it, then you go ahead with the process. And it usually involves um, a medical exam and the right type of insurance. But, so it, who gives the, how do I set this up? I mean, let's say I 
I come there and how do I set it up? How do I get the medical exam? Who's in charge of this? Is it the insurance mm -hmm. company? Is it the facility? How does it work logistically? Can you walk okay. us through that, please? So, for example, on any given day, you meet someone who might be interested. So you give them the day pass, they'll come in, there's an intake process to see if you pre-qualify for it. Then what happens... And excuse me, while mm -hmm. we're on that topic, mm -hmm. what, how would one pre-qualify? Is it based on income? Is it based on ability and agility? Yes, you have to meet a certain uh, qualification for medical um, conditions. So, for example, there's a lot of places that have uh, Alzheimer patients, dementia patients, um, they have also a medical need. For example, folks who've had strokes, heart attacks, who will require uh, physical therapy or occupational therapy. You also have someone who might not be so compliant with their medical appointments and or their medical, um, I'm sorry, their medication. Mm -hmm. So the nurse on site most of the time will offer medication management and assist you in making medical appointments and taking you to medical appointments, which is fantastic because let's say your mom. This is fantastic. I love absolutely. what I'm hearing already. Yeah, absolutely. So let's say you have a mom and your mo you love your mom. You want to be there for your mom, but realistically with your job and day-to-day -day life, mm. you're not going to be able to go. Wouldn't it be great to be able to, for your mom to go to a place where all of this is already taking place? They will care for your loved one the same way you would. Um, and that's the kind of care that a medical model can give. Not to say that a social model can't do the same. A social model, because they assign the home attendant, uh, the home attendant will be able to take them to appointments oh. too. But at a medical model, you have everything right there and you have more control because the nurse is there on a daily basis with them and it's the same nurse each and every day. So how would I know as a viewer, for instance, there are some in Staten Island. Do you, are there any that you're familiar with on Staten Island? Um, there's a few in Staten Island, yes. So how would I know I, I guess I would have to call up and ask, are you a social model or are you a medical model? Is that correct? So uh, some of our referrals come in through the insurance company, and the insurance company already has an idea of what's a social model and what's a medical model. And also they are hopefully more familiar with their uh, patient through the works of a case manager or a case worker ah. through the insurance company. So that case worker or case manager has a set of uh, patients that they help out, and what happens then is they take that step in referring out to the community. Um, another way of getting referrals uh, from the community is hospitals. So again, the hospital is already familiar with this person, uh, what their needs are, so the social worker before discharge will go ahead and set it up. That's one way. Another way is also you walk by. You see a place, hmm, I wonder what this is. You go in and you talk to an intake coordinator there and then you get the next step whether it's right or not. But how would you know if your insurance will pay for this? You said that sometimes it's an insurance lead. What do you mean right. by that? So basically uh, the insurance for the most part has to be Medicaid. Uh, most of the time will be, there's two types of Medicaid. There's the straight <coughs> Medicaid and then the HMO Medicaid. So if it's um, straight Medicaid, usually the person finds out because of a hospital stay or something like that, that's how you get that lead. But it's a lot easier when it's an HMO because the person's already familiar. Again, there's a caseworker or case manager involved, and they'll be able to refer out. So when they refer out, they already know you're in network. Got it. Mm -hmm. Well, this is interesting. So basically, uh, a senior who is needing some assistance would start on this level, and then I suppose from there, they would go to assisted living. It would be the natural progression, right? So. Yeah. Would you like to share about some of the experiences of how this type of service for a senior uh, grows then to the next stage with you? I mean, do you mm -hmm. actually refer us to people yes. to assisted living? That's, Is that how that yes. works? Yes. Lynn and I actually yeah. met that way for, through emails and phone calls. Right. Uh, we've referred uh, back and forth, so yes. Uh, usually an adult daycare is almost like a stepping stone. Yes. So the person would have a need that not necessarily qualifies them to go into a nursing home yet. or So they'll go to an adult daycare. And as their illnesses progress, mm -hmm. they might need an assisted living, not so much a nursing home yet either. So it's all part of a tier process in a way. I'm going to come back and talk to you both about adult daycare centers because there's a lot of questions the viewers have. But I thought that we'd jump over for a minute to assisted living because we have questions about that too. My first question is, how does it differ from 
a nursing home? That's a great question, Angela. Um, I think if you look at skilled nursing facilities, um, the care there is more hospital-like. People need uh, perhaps short-term rehab, perhaps they need long-term care and are going to stay there because of their chronic medical needs. Um, people there generally require 24-hour nursing care, whereas in assisted living, you may need minor assistance with your activities of daily living or your instrumental activities of daily living, um, and then assisted living is a great place for you. And so how does one qualify to get into assisted living, and who pays for it, Michael? That's a loaded question. <laughs> That's a good question. So when it comes to assisted livings, there's really a few different types of assisted livings that fall under that umbrella. Um, the one common type of assisted living, which is actually called an adult home, is the more basic type of facility setting. And in the adult home, you are usually covered either by a private pay rate, which is set forth by the facility itself, or they would actually accept SSI, your actual social security payments as the payment for your stay there. Uh, an, another type of facility that, again, is not quite skilled nursing is called the ALR, the Assisted Living Residence. And in the Assisted Living Residence, similar to the adult home, that rate that you pay is set forth by the facility itself. Um, the rates go anywhere from $1,000 a month to over $10,000 a month, depending on what your needs are and what the facility wants to charge. One very unique program within all this is something called the ALP. The ALP stands for the Assisted Living Program. The ALP is very unique, and that's because it allows the resident to come in under Medicaid. The ALP program, or ALP, is very unique because they actually accept Medicaid as a form of payment. This is something very unique in New York State. It's not so new to the industry. It's been around, but it's a, a growing trend of the Department of Health issuing more and more beds, ALP beds, Medicaid assisted living beds for the communities. And the reason is very simple. In the nursing home, it'll cost the state X amount of money to have a person stay in that home for, per month. In the assisted living program that accepts Medicaid, that same person who maybe would qualify for the nursing home but doesn't quite need all that much help, that'll cost the state a lot less because you don't have all those nurses that Lynn was talking about. You have home health aides who are there to help you with your activities of daily living, and you have your entertainment, your activities, medication management. Everything you need is there except for that 24-hour skilled nursing piece, and that makes it a lot cheaper. So uh, could you tell me one more time, what is the difference between an adult home and assisted living? Uh, an assisted living requires uh, that a patient have minimal assistance with their activities of daily living. Um, they Such offer as? What are the activities of daily uh, living? Maybe your dressing, your bathing. Um, it could be somebody who just needed help with their medications. It could involve some rehabilitation services. Um, or, you know, their cooking, their, their general activities of daily living. Um, banking, perhaps someone needs help with their banking. Um, their meal preparation, those types of activities of daily living. So uh, tell us what goes on in an adult home. Is this where they live there? They actually live there overnight? So it's like almost like a group home for youth, only it's for seniors? So the truth is, when it comes to the adult home and the assisted living, they're very, very closely related. Um, much of the differences are only known to people who are actually in the industry and to the consumer they're really very similar. Overall, typically the adult home caters to people who have minimal needs with activities of daily living, and they, may, they will get the same meals, they're gonna get the same activities, entertainment, they both get medication management. However, it's kind of like up a notch when you need a little bit more help. So for example, if somebody needs help with bathing or dressing on a daily basis, most adult homes will shy away from that kind of care and send you towards the assisted living route. Okay, okay. So in terms of progression then, it seems that uh, a senior who's uh, interested in socializing would go to one of the senior centers or senior daycare centers. Okay. And then when they get to a point where they need a little bit of help, and correct me if I'm wrong, they would go to an adult home and live there, yes? Yes. And get some assistance with medicine management, uh, food, socialization, 
Anything else? I'm just going to throw one more thing in. Um, once we're on the topic, right? Yeah. Uh, when it comes to uh, assisted livings and adult homes, people very often say, well, in what way is it really so different from a nursing home? So what I like to explain to people, aside from the clinical piece, which Lynn explained, mm -hmm. there's also the social piece. A nursing home, a skilled nursing facility, is a place where the setting is very similar to that of a hospital. Yes. The door to your room is basically open 24 hours a day. You're right, you have skilled nurses around the clock, but you don't have all that much privacy. In the assisted living world, the door to your room is pretty much closed. It's your apartment. It's, it's apartment. your room. You have your privacy. So it kind of gives you a little bit more of that socialization piece where you have your own privacy when you want it, but you also have the opportunity to go out and get, get the help you need and spend time with others at the same time. And who pays for the assisted living? So assisted living has two, two routes you go. There's the, the primarily we have private pay assisted living. And then we also have the ALP, which is the Medicaid Assisted Living Program. Do we know how uh, someone can qualify for that financially? Do they have to be on community Medicaid already? Or is it something they, they have to apply five-year look back? How does any of that work? Is that something you okay. can speak on or you'd rather not? No, that's actually great. It's a great question. When it comes to assisted living, people right away shut down. They say, oh, I can't do this. I can't, put out that, I can't put out that money. Or they say, even if I'll get some help, how am I going to be able to afford it? I don't, I don't get enough money from Social Security. It's really very simple. Those people who are receiving funds from Social Security, they may be getting, let's say, $500 a month. And you say to them, $500? That's not going to get me into an assisted living. When you move into an assisted living, it's called congregate care level three. That's not a term you'll ever have to hear. But in <laughs> Social Security world, congregate care level three automatically takes your $500 a month and ups it they give you a larger, higher amount of money per month so that the assisted living can then get paid for your services, thus enabling you to qualify. So in, in essence, if somebody out there is on SSI, they're getting help from, you know, they're getting monthly checks through SSI, they're a shoe in. Financially, they're going to be covered. So Lynn, as a nurse, when you go to do an assessment at someone's home, what is it you look for and what should the viewer expect? Because here's a stranger, very pretty, very nice coming into the home, but perhaps their parent is a little bit nervous and they might even be unfamiliar with the procedure. Let the viewers know what to expect and how do they find someone who does what you do for a living? How would they even do this? Sure. Um, I guess the first thing I'd like to say about that is when I am receiving a referral from the community, it generally comes through one of the assisted living residences. It may come from a skilled nursing facility. It may come from adult okay. daycare programs. Um, and so my first thought about that is making an appointment with the family to come out and assess their loved one. Um, when I do that, uh, there's a brief paperwork that needs to be filled out that more or less talks about someone's ability to be independent. Um, what are they doing with their activities of daily living? Um, and then I want to turn to the family often and ask them, have you seen a change in your mom or your dad? Um, what has that been like? Has it been a social change for them? Do you notice that they go out less? Um, perhaps they have less uh, friends and visits um, and have changed in that regard. Uh, another way would be to find out medically where were they six months ago? What have you noticed in a change for them? Are they doing less? Are you concerned about their safety in the home while you are at work? Um, those are the kinds of questions I might ask a family member. Um, and then, of course, I want to be able to look at the patient or the potential resident and um, get from them what they feel uh, has been a change in their life of late. Um, what are they able to do for themselves? Do they need some assistance with washing and dressing, um, you know, the top part of their body or the bottom? Do they have trouble with their shoes? Um, mm -hmm. How are their memory skills and their medications? So those are the things that I'm assessing while I'm in their home. Are they usually forthright with this information or are they trying to make like everything's okay mm -hmm. because of their concern of losing independence? Right. Um, another very good question. Um, I feel that some, some patients very much are afraid of what that next step is I would be. Um, and may very well try um, to give you a great picture of what they're doing and that uh, their, their children are very supportive but they're overly concerned um, that they're really doing just fine. Um, it's more about looking around the home, seeing the condition of the home, how they are living. You get a lot of clues from that. Give me an idea what you mean by that. 
Well, you may come into someone's home and, you know, interview someone's mom who says everything is fine. I'm taking, I'm taking my medicine. I go to the doctor. I'm healthy, uh, so I don't need to go very often. Uh, I'm, I'm managing just fine. I, I may have meals on wheels, and sometimes I like them, and sometimes I don't, but I'm doing fine. And as I look around in the kitchen, I may notice that, you know, in their refrigerator, they, they don't really have food. The basic I may staples. look in the freezer, and all of their meals are frozen in there from the Meals on Wheels. I may look around and see things that aren't as kempt um, as they used to be. Mm -hmm. um, clutter, perhaps a lot of mail building up, things like that, um, that kind of tip you off. How are they dressed? Uh, that sort of thing. Um, generally speaking, I would say families are very forthright um, in speaking about their loved one and the information that they give to me. Well, this is very helpful, and I know that there are viewers out there that are going through this with their parents, and it's a really sad and trying experience. Mm -hmm. So to have these professionals come on and speak to these issues is really helpful. We're getting good feedback from the community about these shows. Uh, we like to do shows that inform the community about what steps to take to help their Senior and so getting back ones. to adult daycare, what are some points about it that you find are very beneficial for the people that attend? Do you have any nice stories to share, uh, testimonies that people have given to you about their own personal experiences? There are people that come in to adult daycare centers and they might be going through uh, many issues um, at home. And so when they come to an adult daycare center, it's, a, it's an oasis for them. It's a place for them to go and uh, feel safe and socialize with others. The best part about it is you have recreation leaders that are able to come up with different activities. These are creative activities, these are cognitive activities, these are uh, physical activities. For example, we have Zumba, there's yoga, and th that's an example of a mobility activity where they're moving around and it's very energetic and they feel excited and they feel happy and we have music on and music always makes people feel happy. Yes. It doesn't matter where you're from, music always does Unifies it. And, and entertains. Right. And we also have bingo, we have discussions. So at adult daycare centers, there's activities, there's different types of activities. We have creative activities, we have physical activities and cognitive activities. So cognitive activities consist of trivia, perhaps some discussions. We do a lot of reminiscing programs. People get together and they share experiences, they share stories, and they have a great time. They make yes. new friends. We have, uh, there's entertainment, and uh, during the summertime, we go to the parks, we go to the museums. Oh, you have day trips? You, have, you take people out for day there's trips? There's a lot of outings. You have to take advantage of the, sorry to jump in. It's okay. There's a, you have to take advantage of the warm weather. Because think about it, we have so many months that we're cooped up inside, and it's, it's like you're a kid again. As soon as spring comes, you're like, yes, I'm out, I'm doing things, and you want to relive that in your older years too. Just because you get to a certain age doesn't mean that's it, game's over. So you want to keep it fun, you want to be active, and that also helps with your spirit and your body. Because if you're just sitting there not doing anything, everything gets, mm -hmm. eh. But if you're engaged in, even in something simple, uh, such as balloon volleyball, that is a big thing. Balloon volleyball is amazing. Um, so instead of playing with a volleyball and th you know, hitting yourself on the head or jumping around doing it, you could be sitting in a chair playing with a balloon, but it's still competitive because there's always a prize at the end. Even if it's a little tchotchke, there's always a prize. And let's face it. Who among us is not competitive, right? <laughs> <laughs> to a certain degree. It's so true. It, you re-energize, you make friends like Rich says. Right. And um, to answer your question before about some testimonials, uh, sometimes during intake you can meet someone who's very withdrawn. And oh. it's almost like pulling teeth to get to know who they were yes. before they got to whatever situation they're in at the moment. And it's amazing to see the transformation down the road, maybe two months or three months down the road. And then all of a sudden you you run into them and they tell you, oh, by the way, I know there's a lot of room here, so can I just bring my mattress and just hang out here all the time? <laughs> and you're like, no, you, that's the door. You, you don't have to go home, but you got to get out. Um, but it's nice to see the fact that they're transforming because like Rich said before, uh, you're making friends. This is a big thing because some of these folks are coming to an adult take care and 
they're cooped up in four oh, it's walls. Awful. It's awful. So they may not be eating correctly, like Lynn said right. before. They may not be even showering, right? But to know that you now have a purpose, a reason to get up every morning, yes. and you're going to socialize. You may go on trips. Mm -hmm. You may do an activity like Zumba or yoga or whatever have you. Or you may go to the botanical gardens. <laughs> so tell us about some of the trips that people go on. Oh, they're amazing. They're yes, That's actually. So, so they go to the park. They'll go to the beach. The most important thing is to ask where is it they would like to go because when you get their feedback you could put start planning excellent and so what do you, what's your role there so my role is to I'm a hunter, basically. I will go out, <laughs> I will get the referrals, I'll meet the people in the street. Uh, we do a lot of events. So what you do is you'll meet these people mm -hmm. at these events. Mm -hmm. You're, it's kind of an outreach, a yes. street outreach. Yes. And you tell them that, hey, I have, uh, we, I, have I represent a company, an invitation, and there's a yes. daycare or adult daycare center yes. nearby. And you sign them up and get to know them and educate them there. So you don't so much sign them up right then and there. What you do is you invite them to come in. Experience it with their own eyes, their own ears, their own taste buds even because the food is amazing. Yes. Um, so because it's very easy to talk about something. I could show you a picture of a mansion and say, this is where I live. Right. But another thing is you experiencing it for yourself. And, and then the next step is qualifying, pre-qualifying them for their conditions to make sure if it's a medical model, they need to pre-qualify um, for either mental or physical or sometimes mm -hmm. a combo of the two. So am I to understand that if someone wants to go to, because this show airs in five boroughs, mm -hmm. and so depending on where they live, they can find people such as yourself in the different areas who are doing this outreach, or they see a sign that says adult daycare centers. I see these all the time. I'm, I drive in five boroughs oh. all the time, all day long. A road <laughs> warrior. Yes, I'm a road warrior, <laughs> so I'm on the road all the time. And so I see these signs, and quite frankly, I wasn't sure exactly what was going on. Mm -hmm. But if I lived in that area, viewers, what you do is you go to, you can knock on the door, or the phone yes. number usually appears, and you'll meet some nice woman like this nice woman Thank who you. will explain to you about what goes on behind those doors exactly. for your loved one or for yourself yes and so this is great and so once they get there if I'm following you correctly mm -hmm. they will be evaluated to yes. see if they are uh, which model they're better with and it might not be your particular Correct. model so you said you know they'd be better with such and such which would be exactly. a medical model which would offer these other types of services which would you like to repeat them once more at a medical model yes call so it? a medical model um, you well transportation is always involved with uh, both cases mm, or just medical I know more about medical. Oh, okay. Yeah. Speak to that so, because so many seniors need this assistance. Yes. Yeah, so the, with the medical models, uh, almost 99% of the time there's transportation involved. So they'll have their own transportation. And if for whatever reason they live outside of their logistical area, mm -hmm. um, the medical model has authorization through their insurance to go ahead and transport them, which is amazing. Oh, because this is great. You're, not, you're no longer tied to the immediate area. So take, for example, if someone's living in the Bronx and they want to go to a particular adult daycare, say in uh, Queens, now there's no longer that restriction of having just the on-site uh, transportation team. You can now go through the insurance to transport them to the whatever location of their choice. And the insurance company will actually pay for them to go from one borough to the next? Yes. Just based on, not on need necessarily, there as long a, as they qualify, right. they can go to one of their choices, is yes. what I'm asking. Yes, exactly. So. And once they get to that location, uh, there's, there's a nurse on site, and the nurse, uh, let's say, for example, you have high blood pressure. So the nurse, part of your morning routine, will call you into their office. They'll take your blood pressure. If you're a diabetic, uh, oh. they will check your, they'll stick your finger to check your glucose level. Now, mind you, all of this is part of a care plan. So we're both women. Right? But we're not the same women. Right. right? We're all human. He's a guy, he's a guy. But each one of us is very unique. So once you're in, in the program, the nurse and the social worker will come up with a care plan. Basically, a care plan is something that's custom tailored to you. So yours might need physical therapy. I might need occupational therapy. We both might need a little more social uh, interaction. It depends. And what's great about it is, your individual needs are now going to be addressed. So if, for example, I have an issue with my medication, and I, I'm not very good at remembering every single day to take my medication, now under medication management through the nurse, 
they'll assist you. This is great. And so what are the typical hours of a place like this? Because I'm thinking a woman uh, such as myself has to go to work. Mom's at home. I don't want to leave her alone. I just found a perfect solution, mm -hmm. adult daycare. Yes. And so I want to leave her there all day, though, because I don't get home till 6 o'clock. What happens? Do you have pla Are there places that run all day? There are hours, morning hours. There are afternoon hours. You basically have to uh, check um, with the certain facility. Uh, what do the, most of them run? <coughs> What's your familiarity? Uh, eight to one. So what, are, what happens after one to mom? So usually what will happen is there, in that case, if the person, if the individual is really um, needs more help than just the hours provided at the adult daycare, then you can set up home care. And that's something uh, that the social worker at the center itself can assist you with. So again, it's taking the pressure off of you as the home caregiver, let's say, or as the, just the loved one of the person and putting it on the center now. Beautiful. So what will happen is it's more, it alleviates you, it gives you a respite. Basically, that's what it is. It gives you respite. And so peace of mind. Yes. Because people have to go to work and they're in the sandwich generation now. Yes. And so, uh, yes. I want to piggyback off something she yes. said earlier. Yes. About having an individualized care plan. When we do activities, we try to modify the activities for the particular individual. Uh, we, ha we may have an individual that has a stroke, and we're going to have to modify the activity. For example, uh, if we're painting, maybe they can't hold the brush. So there's devices that where you can use your mouth, or maybe we could show them how to use the left hand. There are just many different ways to oh, modify. Oh, this is so encouraging. So we've been talking about um, minimal assistance for seniors to attend uh, an adult daycare. Uh, and there's also the medical model, which is something new that I didn't realize. There were two different models. Are they ever combined in, under one roof? So with the uh, medical model, you do have the aspect of social um, daycare all in a way because you're not going to be spending that much time with the nurse, with their uh, physical therapy, or occupational therapy all day. So you do have a gap in the program, which will allow social for the social to someone right. like yourself. I do want to say though, uh, just take it through a breakdown of what a day would be like. Yes. Is that okay? So they would come, they have breakfast, and they might do some prayers, and oh. then we have several activities going on. So you'll have, let's say, you start the day with current events. Uh, many people do not turn on the TV. They do not know what's going on. They may not have a smartphone <laughs> to see what's going on. So we have current events there where we discuss different topics uh, briefly, unless people want to go in a little more. Uh, we'll do a little movement, and it'll go in right there from uh, bingo or having a special game, our own, ver own version of Family Feud or Price is Right. <laughs> and you know, a little music, entertainment. Some of these facilities would have monthly birthday parties to celebrate everyone's birthday for that particular month. So it's very exciting. There's a lot that goes on. Excellent. So tell me, this sounds similar to what goes on at my mom's nursing home. She's in the, my mother-in-law's in the nursing home now, some of these activities. Um, what has been your experience with the social side? At assisted living, there are a lot of great activities as well. Uh, they go on trips, Mets games. Yes. Uh, I believe recently there has even been um, a trip to a local TV show, which what? the residents really enjoyed. They also have activities on site that are much like the adult day program activities. And again, you want to encourage the residents to talk about what they liked, what they used to enjoy, what they miss. Um, we have someone right now who is very interested in dancing again and the recreation aid is working on that. So there's lots of great things going on all the time. Just to wow. piggyback off of what Lynn said, the truth is assisted livings, there's many different types of them out there. And the activities that we provide really are based on the acuity level of the actual individual residents that live in the home. So everything Lynn said is true. Residents living in assisted livings have a lot of options in terms of the activity programs that are available to them. But if you're thinking that your loved one may be a little too frail, a little too weak to go out on some of these trips, don't think that assisted livings are not for you. Good point. Right. Uh, assisted livings obviously cater to those that live and reside in their homes. So we may have trips that go out, but there are some homes that don't do that many trips out and really bring the entertainment in 
to the home themselves. So it's both. It's whatever mm -hmm. you need is being offered to the senior, which is what I like. They can go yeah. to a place and take advantage of trips that go out, or they can stay in and get all the entertainment they need. What are the other differences or benefits of assisted living versus nursing home? Was there anything else you wanted to share, either of you? Well, I think that, you know, again, the difference in skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities is the amount of care that a resident may need and what they're able to, to do. Um, again, the nursing home, you're going to have 24-hour nursing care and nursing assistance, and you're going to need more care for your complex medical issues. And the assisted living, of course, allows you more independence um, with needing just minor assistance of activities of daily living. What are the biggest challenges for a family when it comes time to thinking about assisted living uh, versus a nursing home? When it comes to making a decision like that, knowledge is power. So shows like this, mm -hmm. this is key. The more you know, the better informed you'll be, and you'll make a better decision. <laughs> Very often when people hear nursing home, they shut down. They say, nursing home, skilled nursing facility, not for me. They think nursing home, they think end of life. But the truth is, when it comes to nursing home, when it comes to assisted living, when it comes to daycare, this is all a matter of finding the right program for you at the right time. If I had to give anybody advice on what to look for when they go in to take a tour of any one of these settings, the main thing to look for is the people you're talking to. If you find yourself talking to someone who's, who seems to be compassionate, someone who gives you that feeling of warmth, of caring, you know you're in the right place. Excellent. Any closing thoughts? I encourage all families to visit as many assisted livings as possible to find the right fit for their loved one. That's good advice. Any thoughts about adult daycare that you want to share in closing? I think it's a great way to close the gap of a need, but not an extreme need. So it's almost like a little... It's a stepping stone for yes, sure. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I shared in the last show uh, that I feel is very important is that assisted living facilities and nursing homes install nanny camps. And so I'm going mm -hmm. to be speaking about this on every senior show that we do. So I'm going to see if I can apply to get a bill started. I'm going to speak to councilmen, whoever are in charge of this, or councilwomen. I think it's very important as more and more seniors get admitted to these places. They're all, so many of them are well run, but I do feel that there's a margin of possibility of uh, abuse that could happen because we're a human group here because we're human beings and we're hiring human beings and they're fallible. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that in closing? I think in general when it comes to staff members who work in settings like nursing homes or assisted livings, uh, yes, we definitely take our steps. It's important to note that in order for someone to qualify to work in a setting like that, they must go through background checks. Yes. It's not find someone today, they can start working tomorrow. That's not how it works. Someone comes in, obviously there's a vetting process, they go through the interview, they, depending on the job they're applying for, they may have to have certain training, a certain certificate or license. But imp more important than that is prior to them actually starting work, they actually have their name run through a system to make sure that this is someone that has no previous history. In addition to that, as managers and supervisors working in settings like that, you're always on the lookout. You always want to make sure that your people are getting the best care possible. So you just gave me another idea. Do we have a central registry for adult caregivers like we do for people who work with children? So I'm not familiar with how it works with people who work with children. However, the way it's broken down is by the profession. So for example, people who are RNs, there's a registry of all RNs, LPNs, also another registry, CNAs. I'm talking H about the aides that work right. in the homes directly washing and feeding the adults. CNAs, home health aides. What is CNA? CNA stands for Certified Nursing Assistant. Those are the aides found in nursing homes. Okay, so is there a central registry where, is if, there, where if there were abuse issue that it would be registered? Exactly. And I'm asking, is there? Yes, there is. As employers, when someone's brought on as a CNA or as a HHA, which stands for Home Health Aid, those names must be run by the agency or organization employing them. I'm so glad to hear this. What is your opinion about a nanny cam in the nursing homes or assisted living? Well, I think that, you know, in today's world, there's more opportunity to um, find the good and the, the bad, unfortunately, in people. And I'm certainly all for having more supervision than less. So, so if I get this bill run, uh, would you support it? Yes, I would. I'm glad to hear that. What do you think? I think it makes people more aware that it is a human being that you're dealing with. And 
I'm sorry, I strongly believe it, like in the Bible says, do unto others as you want done unto yourself. Oh, it's a woman so, after my own heart. <laughs> so if, if you take care of someone, try to take care of them like you would want to be treated. Yes, and but it, I'm asking more about the nanny cams. Yeah. So I, you would I, support that? Absolutely. Okay. In some of the facilities, they're already installed. Mm -hmm. Oh, Be really? Absolutely, Good. because it, it creates accountability. Right. Okay, and your thoughts on that? Nanny cams, just that thought. I think it's great. I think it'll basically make people aware that there's someone else watching. And as Gabby says, you have to treat... Uh, people the same way that you would want to be treated. One day we're all going to get there <laughs> and we're all going to want the right help and be treated yeah. like a human being. And don't think I'm, see, because I'm not that far away from <laughs> that point, I think it might take a good <laughs> amount of years to get this going. Don't think I'm altruistic in this idea. Uh, so thank you uh, all for participating. I think thank it was you. a good thank discussion. You. Thank you viewers for watching. Uh, you can watch the Heart of New York show every Tuesday night in Staten Island at 8 p.m. on Channel 34. We also run in the other boroughs. In Brooklyn, we're on at 10.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. We're on in Manhattan at 4 p.m. on Wednesdays. And you can also catch us on YouTube. So thanks for watching, and please tune in again. And if you wish to appear on the show, call 212-332-3444. And let us know your thoughts if you have an idea for a show. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. I'm Angela Hart. Do you know that a lot of seniors live in isolation these days? And a lot of seniors need a place to live. And so I have a guest who's come on to the show today. He's with an organization that helps match people who have a home with those who need one and whose personalities and living styles would work well together. His name is Jameson Champion, and he is a champion. He's a champion of the rights of seniors, and he helps a lot of people in our community. So I've invited him to come on to the TV show. I'm going to allow him to introduce himself to you. And what's really exciting about this is that the show is all about helping seniors. And this particular segment is about roommate service for seniors. Jameson, welcome to the show. Thank you, Angela. I really appreciate it. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Jameson Champion, and I am Assistant Director of Programs for the New York Foundation for Senior Citizens. New York Foundation for Senior Citizens is a large nonprofit organization founded in 1968 and currently serving seniors in all five boroughs of New York City. Um, today, I want to talk about our home sharing program, as Angela mentioned. Our home sharing program is a free service that matches individuals in shared living arrangements in private homes and apartments throughout the city. So Jameson, how does the program work? How can uh, someone who needs a place get matched up with an elderly person who has a room for them? Um, how the process works is individuals who have an extra available spare bedroom in their home or apartment um, contact our office, oftentimes for financial reasons or companionship reasons or sometimes both. Um, and say that they would like to be matched with a compatible roommate. Our social workers will go out to the um, applicant's home and do a comprehensive interview. Um, and they will ask a lot of questions, 31 questions to be exact. Such as what? What would the top five questions be? Great question. The top five questions are all about living style and living preference. And we find that those things are, uh, matter the most in terms of ensuring compatibility and ensuring um, a good match and a good fit. So the top five questions could be something like, would you live with someone who smokes or would you prefer a non-smoker? A big one is kitchen um, pr uh, use. Would you prefer someone who will not use the kitchen late at night or would you be open to that? Another big question is uh, schedule. Daily schedule is really big in terms of are you somebody that would like someone around more often or would you like someone that is out of the home more often? Um, so those are some of the big questions, but like I said, we go through 31 of them, and those are called our 31 variables. Okay. So, Jameson, tell us about, what about with pets? Does that, does that become one of the questions? Great question. Yes, absolutely. We ask about pets. One, uh, if the person has a pet, or if they don't, if they'd be open to living with someone who does. And I'm glad you mentioned it, because we just recently matched um, two uh, women up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan one had a dog and one had a cat. Our mm -hmm. first thought was no way this could work. <laughs> but um, as luck would have it, the dog and cat got along perhaps just as well as the, the two women do. And now everyone's living together, cat, dog, and, and the roommates. Happily. This is fantastic and happily. Yes. 
So how much does this cost for seniors to join this This program? is a completely free service. Um, it is funded by the New York City Department for the Aging, the New York State Office for the Aging, as well as discretionary funds from local elected officials. Viewers, who knew? Who knew that there was a free roommate service for seniors? And I think most of us in our community have relatives that are living alone or who might need a change of pace uh, to keep them company and maybe even offer some financial assistance. I assume that the person who moves into the home pays? Yes, absolutely. And how much do they pay in, to the person? How do you yes. arrange their fee payment? So that is something when we get the two parties together that is obviously discussed. The price um, in terms of the monthly contribution to household expenses requested by the host is completely up to the host. They set that price. Well, what do you find in, like, for instance, in Staten Island, this show will air in, in all five boroughs, but in Staten Island, what would a typical furnished room, and, and it is, is it finished, furnished, and is the room furnished? Great question. Um, we have both furnished and unfurnished rooms, and that's one of the 31 questions that we ask during the interview. Would, would the guest uh, prefer a furnished room or an unfurnished mm -hmm. room, and would the host prefer a guest who uh, is bringing their belongings or would prefer a furnished room? Um, the price you asked about Staten Island, um, typically over the past year, the price in Staten Island and some of the outer boroughs has generally gone for around 500 uh, on up. On up, and in Manhattan it might be even 1,200, would you say, or is there a cap? Manhattan over the past year or so has been uh, a little bit more expensive, as one couldn't possibly imagine, um, and typically our Manhattan hosts are charging 900 on up. But again, that changes all the time. And what if the people are living together and they find that they're not really a good match? Well, one, I would like to say that, first off, that the, the number of people who are not a good match is very, very small. And why that is, is our team of social workers really goes in depth and really looks at personality, lifestyle, and characteristics and ensures that it will be a good match. So I could probably count on one hand um, wow. the amount of matches that don't work out. Um, but in the, in the unlikely event that a match is not working out for whatever reason, if people feel that they're not compatible, um, we will certainly rematch them. Um, we would do an interview and find out why the match didn't work, um, what characteristics or what issues came up, and use that information to rematch them in a more suitable uh, match. So how many people have, has your agency placed or matched? What do you call the match? Yes, um, it's a match. We've placed, uh, we do about 40 matches a year approximately. Um, but so you would like to do more? 80 individuals, yes, we would always like to do more. Um, so with increased funding, we certainly could. Um, and we've uh, been operating this program since 1981 and have matched thousands upon thousands in these shared living arrangements. But who knew this was around? Who knew that there was such a service? And this is why I'm so glad you've come on the show to speak to people because this show, as I said, airs in five boroughs. Mm -hmm. And hopefully a lot of caregivers will be watching because those, are, I suppose, are the ones who contact you usually? Yes, absolutely. And you're right. Um, this Opportunities like this to get the word out about our program are so vitally important as a um, as a pro social service program and a nonprofit organization, we greatly appreciate opportunities like you've provided uh, uh, us today to, to spread the word about our program because we want to make sure that everyone who needs this type of service knows about it and knows that it's completely free. What else can you tell us about the program? What have been some of the, what have been some of the challenges you've experienced? Well, so challenges um, is, has been. Uh, getting the word out, first and foremost. So we, uh, that's always a challenge to make sure that we get the word out as, possi as widely as possible. Um, there's also challenges in terms of, but they're good challenges, challenges in terms of working with different personalities, different characteristics, <laughs> different lifestyles, different desires in terms of what people want in their shared living arrangement and working to best meet those. So it's always a challenge, but it's a good challenge and a challenge that our social workers really relish. And where are your offices located? Our main office is located in downtown Manhattan um, at 11 Park Place. Do you have any testimonial stories that you've heard of people that uh, maybe weren't comfortable at first and then called you and said how happy they were? We do. You know, um, as I was mentioning before, one of the main um, draws of our program for a lot of our applicants is um, companionship. Um, and so we have a lot of people who come to our service who are seeking companionship, who might feel so socially isolated or might need a friend um, and this service in addition to providing an affordable place to live and supplementing the income of the host it really provides companionship and friendship and over the years we've seen countless matches where 
two people from two different walks of life come together and a fabulous friendship results. Um, it's really heartwarming to see. Oh, how about any romances? Any marriages? Don't know about any marriages yet, um, but it certainly is possible, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we do have a one match who has been together for more than 15 years in a long-term friendship. Mm -hmm. This is great. So viewers, I wanted to let you know that this service is available for seniors and certainly if you have friends or neighbors or relatives that need to find someone to live in their home or a home to live in, and but please contact Jameson's office. By the way, Jameson, is it more the situation that your clients have a place or they're seeking a place? So, well, there's need on both sides, Angela. Um, there's many people who contact us and need uh, supplemental income or need companionship and therefore are really interested in offering their home to share. And then there's also a tremendous need for people who are looking for a place to live. So it sounds like it's a good match. It is a good match. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Jameson. Thank you I so much I hope that you get a lot me. of calls now and I hope that we get a lot of seniors placed uh, it, through the program and let us know about your success rate and please come on the show again. Thank you. I certainly will, Angela. Thank you so much for having me. It's been good. Bye-bye, everybody. Hi. My name is Vicki Elner. I'm the founder and CEO of Senior Umbrella Network of Brooklyn, affectionately known as Sunbee. So Senior Umbrella Network of Brooklyn is a not-for-profit organization that was established in 2003. And the primary vision for it was to be a forum for stakeholders to get together, to share ideas, uh, to network, to educate and uh, advocate for senior issues uh, and for families and seniors in the community. We went through a planning process that started with first aid uh, with an exploratory meeting. And we got together about 50 or 60 professionals in the Brooklyn community. And there wasn't a facet, it was amazing with Brooklyn with all its seniors, uh, that there wasn't an organization that existed that encompassed what our vision was in order to get professionals together. Uh, and after we had that meeting and there was such a positive response, we had a nine-month planning process where we met together, the steering committee, and we talked about how we wanted to launch it, getting guest speakers, what our mission would be, what our goals would be, and then finally in September of 2003, it's hard for me to, you know, to think about that now because <laughs> those <laughs> years went by so that quick. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, we launched the meeting and, uh, in Brooklyn and it was just, it was a wonderful success and, and it has been, you know, to date in, t in terms of fulfilling what our goals are. And what are our goals? Yes. And what is our mission? Yes. So the first, and when I start telling people, and I just had a meeting earlier today, people say to me, well, you're a networking organization. And you know what? I think at the basis of everything, networking is a process that exists in an organization like ours. So yes, we are a networking organization. But over and above that, we're also an organization that has a strong advocacy voice mm -hmm. for issues related to seniors, their families, and the community. And, uh, and part and parcel with that was a focus on fighting ageism. There was also uh, providing access uh, to services, which um, when we used to print a directory, I am reminded of somebody who looked at our directory and said, you know what, I didn't realize how many things could go wrong with somebody until <laughs> I looked at your directory. So the, really the uh, breadth and the depth of senior services and senior issues are you know, very much uh, abounding uh, today, uh, especially since the 85 plus is the fast and growing segment of our population. So that strong voice is, is also very important. And I think that over the years that we have really lived up to what our mission, our goals are. And also an organization, if we don't change, you don't evolve. So we're always looking for opportunities to do that. And with that being said, one of the things that we are anticipating now and exploring is looking into expanding into Staten Island, into the Staten Island community. Uh, because we feel that 
senior services aren't just certainly as segregated in the Brooklyn community. Uh, they're rampant all over, and we do have members from Staten Island. In fact, we have members on this panel that are from Staten Island. So we'd like to have a presence here, and we'd like to expand we'd like to expand our membership because membership is a way that funds our organization um, and we also would like to find out more about what the challenges are happening in, in the in the Staten Island com community and how that works vis-a-vis -vis Brooklyn community and the other boroughs and people ask me all the time well are you just in Brooklyn uh, senior issues touch everybody Yes. Mm -hmm. And whether you're in Brooklyn or you're in Manhattan or if you're in Staten Island, the boundaries blur uh, because you may have a family member who is a senior that lives in Brooklyn and their children live in Nassau County. So uh, we like to feel that we are addressing all of that as an organization and satisfying and living up to what our mission, our goals, and what our passion is for services today and an organization of our type that can flourish. I'm so psyched that you're coming, you're considering bringing this to Staten Island.